My name is Nikita Lamagan. I'm an academic director of uh, this program, Energy Politics in Eurasia, and a professor at European University. And within our series of lectures, uh, within the workshop, uh, we are pleased to welcome today uh, Dr. Uh, Stefan Dudek, our long-term partner at European University, uh, who works uh, both uh, at uh, our uh, Center for Nordic Studies uh, together with uh, Nikolai Vachtin and his uh, uh, great team. And he also uh, works at the Arctic Center of the University of Lapland in Finland. Uh, uh, Dr. Dulek uh, holds uh, a doctorate degree at the University of Leipzig uh, from 2011. And maybe uh, he's one of a uh, few uh, scholars who studied the way how indigenous people in the Russian North and Russian Siberia uh, feel about uh, development of oil and gas sectors in those regions. Normally we are talking about billions of cubic meters, uh, millions of tons, uh, and uh, we, but we do not pay a lot of attention to other side of the pipeline. And his lecture today will be devoted exactly to relationship between indigenous people and oil companies to the survival strategies as uh, people would say, and what's happening to what extent those relationships are conflicting. So uh, the way how we'll uh, run this event is, uh, is, is as following. So maybe uh, within 30 or 40 minutes, uh, Dr. Dudek uh, will present uh, his uh, major findings. Please listen to him attentively and be ready to ask questions. Uh, and uh, after his presentation, the floor will be open for you. Comments, suggestions, and questions. Please, uh, Professor Dudek, the floor is yours. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nikita. I, I just just, um, oh, I have to start my presentation. Um, can you tell me if you can see and hear me and see the presentation? Yes. Okay, great. Then I'll start. Uh, so my background is from social or also called cultural anthropology, which is a discipline uh, defined by unique methodology. Uh, what are anthropologists uh, doing and what distinguish them from other social scientists is that they they share during their uh, research everyday life of the people and try through this kind of sharing uh, to understand them, uh, the lives of the people in their social, cultural and political context. We call this methodology uh, participant observation. That's what makes maybe uh, anthropologists special and it allows us to link uh, the micro level, the, the really everyday lives uh, and, and worries and problems of people with bigger pictures of social relations, uh, conditions and limitations that uh, people are experiences in their, experiencing in their lives. Um, and often these are very global contexts and that's something I, I will speak about today as well. Uh, uh, the, the, the context of extractive industries of big oil and gas businesses. Um, and I will try in this lecture to uh, link this, uh, as Nikita Oja told you, with the other end of the pipeline, the everyday life of, of people, and in, in my case, indigenous people. I will talk about who are indigenous people in a, in a second. Um, uh, but uh, what is the anthropology of oil? Actually, what do, uh, what do anthropologists do when they pay attention to, uh, to oil in, 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 the, in the large picture? Of course, uh, we perceive oil as a resource important for human life and human societies today. Uh, and we look as anthropologists to the way that humans organize their relationship uh, in their societies around these important source of energy, the types of ex exchange they have with the environment and among each other, but also to non-human beings like animals, like their ancestors, uh, but also to, to uh, entities, to institutions like the state, uh, big uh, companies. Uh, we look also to um, aspects, to legal aspects, to uh, what we would call legal anthropology that pays attention to the plurality of ideas that humans have on legal regulations, uh, legal frameworks, national, the, the interplay of international legal frameworks, national law, but also customary law, 
and ideas of justice and conflict management of local, very local and very small scale communities and, and ethnic groups. Uh, and then we pay also attention to the question of inequality, what makes people different and how they differently experiencing um, the environment, economic and political and social conditions of their life and how uh, these inequalities might be influenced by uh, oil and gas and energy, other energy resources. Um, of course, what is important if we if we think about extractive industries and oil and and people is the way that uh, social life is impacted by the production, but also by the consumption of these energy resources. So the next slide. I mean, this is something that I guess you all see the big players in the oil business, the big nation, the, the nations that that have the biggest share in oil productions at the moment are Russia. Uh, the US and, and Saudi Arabia, and but it's also uh, a market that changes very quickly and unpredictably the developments. I mean, what you can see here on this on easily on this uh, graph is the, the effect of the shale oil revolution that pushed the US to the top of the of the global production. Um, but also how these new technology technologies will bring further change and of course also further change to human lives and that's something that we try to pay attention of i re really like to show my students at the beginning these kind of distorted maps projections of things that we usually don't project we project areas to uh, geographical maps but here what you can see is uh, what happens if you project the amount of oil exports in this map uh, to, to, to a map, to a global map, and you see that the Arabian Peninsula is blown up. Uh, also, you see Norway uh, in a very big scale. Um, you don't almost see uh, Africa and South America, with some uh, ex ex exceptions, and you, for instance, don't see Japan, which you see very big here on this other distorted map. Uh, where you see the oil, the countries, according to the amount of oil imports that they get. Uh, this just the uh, one aspect that I, I, I would call inequality, the inequality of distribution of exports and imports of production and consumption. Um, uh, but we will now move like slowly more into the details. And you will see that at every level, from the very big picture to the very small picture, uh, we see this inequalities and how oil uh, production and consumption is, is associated with that. Here, now I'm introducing my case study. We move into the Eurasian continent. Uh, I did field work since I would say the mid of the 90s in Western Siberia, just in the very center of, the, of Eurasia uh, in, the, in, a, in a region called Hanti Mansiski uh, Autonomous District. And especially around a town called Kogalim, I will speak about Kogalim in a few seconds. Uh, another map where you see the Kanti Mansi uh, Autonomous District just uh, behind the Ural Mountains in Western Siberia. And here a map uh, where you see you, you, you see the, the, the regions that produce uh, oil in Russia. It's a little bit old, but actually mm, it didn't change much. Uh, uh, the Kanti Mansi uh, Autonomous District is still the biggest oil producing region in Russia. It's producing almost half or slightly over half of the Russian uh, oil. Um, and Western Siberia is still the big uh, oil producing region. Uh, of course, it started all, as you might know, around the Caspian Sea, then um, moved uh, to the after the or during and after the Second World War to the Volga Ural regions. Here you see the red. Uh, regions like Komi Republic, Tatarstan, Bashkortostan, and then uh, after the war in the 60s and, and especially in the 70s and 80s to Western Siberia, but now the kind of the new um, the new areas are here around the Akhotsk Sea, um, uh, Sakhalin, which is not here on the map, but also uh, you see here the northern. I uh, you actually you see a uh, Sakhalin here, and then the Akhotsk Sea. Uh, but also Yakutia and the Irkutsk Oblast. But this just uh, still the big picture. Um, yeah. Uh, now to the Khanti uh, Mansiski Autonomous District. It's a region that is heavily dependent on oil production um, on 
an oil industry, over 90% of the local uh, economy uh, is in the sector of extractive energy and actually the other sectors are serving that, um, that sector, like the uh, production of um, electric energy and um, um, uh, building of machinery. Uh, and that's how the one of the big players I'm, I, I will speak about here quite a bit. Uh, one of the big companies in Russia, a multinational corporation, uh, Luke Oil, um, kind of in, in her, their Western Siberian headquarters of Kogalim are advertising their uh, position and their, they, how they would uh, imagine and how they would, um, how, 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 how they see themselves as, um, as the, the, the ones who are warming up the world, how they frame it here in an, um, in a in an advertisement, uh, and I took this picture to in a way to symbolize their log logic of uh, what what we would call extractivism, a perspective on resource as materials to be extracted for maximizing benefits for humans uh, and seeing nature as the site of extraction uh, and human human society on the other side as the side that would benefit from that extraction uh, by enhancing well-being, of course. Uh, so this logic is, a, is a one of, of minimizing efforts and maximizing benefits um, uh, uh, as, as, as this relationship could be summarized. Um, uh, a little bit more about the region, um, uh, about the natural environments of the region. Western Siberian lowlands are characterized by, by actually three zones of vegetation from the steppe belt in the south. Uh, you know, might know what the steppe is, the kind of um, forestless um step zone then over the taiga zone which with the boreal forest very huge uh, forest zone and up then in the north to the tundra uh the boreal treeless areas in the north um this this uh, region contains the world's biggest marshlands and is beside uh, the oceans uh, one of the main carbon sinks and that's maybe the the most important uh, ecological feature of these regions through their huge marshes, which you can see here through the blue color. The green color are the forest. And the, the, the region is also characterized by one of the big uh, Siberian rivers, the Op River. Uh, a picture, uh, an aerial picture, which gives you um, an impression of how the landscape looks like. You see here the forest tundra with the marshlands in early winter, and you see uh, a band of the of a river visible through a slightly different um, forest, uh, coniferous forest here along the river. That's the, um, the landscape of the Khantimansi uh, Autonomous Okrug uh, or district, where since the 60s, large oil fields were discovered uh, and industrial towns were growing like mushrooms. This is a picture, quite old picture from the city of Surgut, which um, is uh, nowadays uh, inhabited by almost over 400,000 inhabitants, one of the major uh, Western Siberian cities. Uh, another picture, and now I come to Kogalim again, the headquarter of uh, the Western Siberian headquarter of Lukoil, which is of course based at their main headquarter in, in Moscow. Um, and that's a typical town hosting uh, the workforce for the, uh, for the oil companies. But what I will talk about today is more people living on the land and in order to understand the difference between uh, the urban lifestyle and the and the forest lifestyle I, I start usually with uh, talking a little bit about the footprint that these um, different ways of life leave on the uh, on the ground here you see an aerial photo of the town of Kogalim you can recognize the the proper uh, center of the town here in the north in the in the upper left corner but you see here on the right side a huge industrial area and uh, surprisingly for western siberia but it's very important for this urban uh, inhabitants um, a huge area of summer houses uh, called dacha in, in, in russian which is here located on the outskirts of the city uh, still in the 60s uh, there was a small reindeer herders camp Somewhere here on the river, the river is called Ingu Yaun, uh, and somewhere here there was a family of Hanti reindeer herders uh, living uh, on this river, quite similar to 
uh, a family whose um, uh, whose living area I'm depicting here with the satellite image, uh, maybe a, a little bit uh, less than 100 kilometers away from the city of Togalim. Uh, this the, this picture has the same scale um, as the as the image before, and here you 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 don't really see the settlement. If if you if you are able to see my arrow here on the upper left corner, here you see the human settlement, but the, what you see in the center are the reindeer pastures, uh, lakes and swamps uh, that are used by this family as uh, spring and, um, and summer pastures for their little reindeer herd of almost 200 reindeer. And then you see here between two rivers, you see the uh, winter pastures that they use in the more forested areas. This is a picture of a typical winter settlement of the reindeer herders um the the region is inhabited by inhabitant uh, um, there are uh, four different uh, indigenous um, uh, peoples living in that area inhabiting the kanti mansi autonomous district the hanti the mansi the forest manats and the ijma komi uh, who belong to more than 40 uh, uh, 40 different indigenous groups that are recognized officially in the russian federation uh, called uh, small numbered indigenous people of the Russian Far North, Siberia, and the Far East, um, who came gradually under, under Russian rule since the late Middle Ages, um, mostly uh, since the 16th century when, Russian, when the Russian state expanded eastwards over the Ural Mountains into the vast lands of Siberia. Uh, their economy is characterized by, um, uh, by mixed uh, activities uh, besides the reindeer herding that I was already mentioning, also hunting uh, fur animals, but uh, fishing is in the Western Siberian lowlands, a very important uh, economic activity, and, but also gathering natural products like uh, berries in the, in the autumn. Uh, the families usually inhabit several seasonal settlements located uh, at different reindeer pastures. I spoke already about the winter, uh, the spring and the um, summer pastures on the open areas where the mosquitoes are not uh, kind of attacking the uh, poor reindeer so much. But in the winter, they are in these forested areas that you can also see here. Uh, what is important is to, to mention that these animals are actually, they are semi-domestic animals not like uh, you might know cows and horses cattle and pigs uh, they are um, they are only semi-domestic which means that they very much follow their natural annual migration circles that they look for the food themselves um, they are roaming freely and it's uh, it's a very different relationship that uh, um, that um, uh, in comparison to what i spoke about uh, the 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 way that uh, the companies are uh, imagining resources and maybe you as well. This is a, a kind of uh, it's it's not looking at reindeer as something you uh, should um, where you should maximize the benefit from, but it's also um, it's also a resource that actually humans have to adapt to. Um, that uh, humans have uh, through the centuries adapted their lifestyle in a way that it fits to the lifestyle of the reindeer. It's not the the humans domesticating and controlling and managing the reindeer it's the maybe the other way around or in a more balanced way the humans uh, adapting and domesticating themselves to the way that the reindeer are living out there in the environment and building their settlements where the reindeer have to be grazed and where the reindeer uh, where it fits back actually uh, the lifestyle of the reindeer in a way so uh, especially important are the lichens found in old ground forests uh, to feed the reindeer in winter, where they can dig it out from under the snow. Uh, but the humans also defend reindeers by, uh, from the predators, wolves and bears, and regulate the avail availability of food. Uh, this form of uh, human-animal relationship one could call based on mutuality, a principle organizing not only human-animal relations, but also organizing social relations within the human society, between the Hanti themselves. In order to understand these relations of mutuality, usually we anthropologists speak about the notion of reciprocity, uh, humans interacting with, uh, with others through reciprocal relations. That, of course, means uh, receiving and giving uh, 
through specific rules, one should not, of course, idealize that and don't forget that there are also uh, relations of power involved in these reciprocal relationship. It's not always an equal relationship. Um, yeah, another picture which shows you another important activity of these local economies, a very ancient type of fishing with fish wires and fish traps, a technology that was spread over the northern hemisphere in a lot of regions, but in this region it, it still is an important uh, technology, very ancient technology of, of fishing. Um, to uh, a few words on the historical background uh, and, and the period that started from the oil development uh, since the 70s. Um, through this uh, 70s and 80s, the, the last period of Soviet uh, of the Soviet state in, in Siberia, they were actually um, characterized by a very fast and, uh, and very quick development of, uh, of oil businesses and oil extraction and industries that made uh, the indigenous po population secondary, uh, especially for state policy as industrialization moved to the focus. Uh, economic decline, uh, that mean, meant uh, um, economic decline for the culture, for the agricultural enterprises, coal horses, fishing factories, but also the state the hunting enterprises. Um, from the 30s of the 20th century on, there was a sedentarization uh, program that was at that point almost abandoned because a lot of Hanti families didn't want it to move into the central settlements that the state provided them. And uh, through the kind of uh, lowering control of the state, of the late Soviet state, a lot of Hanti families actually moved back to the forest, gave up their uh, their um, houses and flats in the villages which uh, which were declining and which were degrading and moved uh, moved back to the forest but the ones who remained in these villages were lacking all were lacking almost uh, okay. state support. Um, could you switch off your microphone yeah thank you um, but at the end of the 80s we we saw also the local uh, intelligentsia the, the educated people among indigenous groups um, starting to speak out about the social and cultural problems that they saw, especially in these villages. The loss of language, uh, uh, rampant joblessness, um, alcoholism and suicide were at the very high level uh, and the life expectancy of indigenous people being almost uh, at that time and uh, still also in post-Soviet times, almost 10 years lower than the Russian average. Um, yeah, but we could also uh, speak not only about this uh, social problems and, and kind of dark sides of the development of oil industry, but we also see is a quite high level of uh, what one could tell, what one could call community resilience. I spoke already about the, the failed sedentarization and the preservation of traditional semi-nomadic settlement patterns. People moved into the forest to their traditional settlements. Uh, but we saw also something that we, uh, we know from a lot of other northern and Arctic regions, actually, um, what is usually called by social scientists gender shift, shift or female flight. Uh, that means that uh, a, a particular gender problem appears in northern villages and small scale communities where the higher educated people leave. And these are usually the women, uh, while the men remain with the traditional businesses of hunting and reindeer herding or fishing, uh, women gain education and then move to the cities, marry people who uh, come from the outside and the local communities um, uh, experiencing a very harsh gender balance, uh, gender imbalance or asymmetry. That is something that happened, didn't happen in these Western Siberian oil provinces. And that's very surprising. Uh, because um, people, through their movement back to the forest settlements and traditional livelihoods, they kind of uh, avoided that development because their families still live together, uh, men and women and children are grown up uh, and, and brought up in these uh, reindeer herders uh, camps. And the reindeer, the important of, uh, importance of uh, reindeer herding actually grew. That was also uh, surprising because everybody uh, would expect that through the ecological damage and through the uh, influence of uh, urbanization um, and growing 
uh, influx of population, reindeer herding might decline, but the opposite was the case. If you look at the reindeer, at the numbers of reindeer, especially in this uh, subarctic boreal forests, we see them growing. And this is a quite surprising finding that that is asking, of course, for explanation. I will come to that in a few minutes. A few words now mm, on indigenous rights movements uh, that influenced, of course, the late Soviet and post-Soviet uh, development of indigenous people and their uh, social um, conditions quite, uh, um, quite um, uh, seriously. Uh, so I want to, to tell you some words on, on the broader picture of indigenous rights and how, what is that about? Um, that's uh, it, it, the, the notion of indigenous rights and, and uh, an indigenous rights movement appeared after the Second World War uh, during the time of colonization, during the time when a lot of uh, colonies of European nation states became independent. Um, but there remained certain groups and certain minorities that were also facing uh, similar problems. Um, that uh, colonized nations would try to solve through independence, but these groups uh, didn't want it or didn't aim at, uh, at, at state independence. So they remained in bigger nation states, but they remained there on their ancestral lands uh, and uh, were looking for alternatives uh, to, uh, to, um, to, uh, to, to solve the problems of uh, exploitation of resources without their participation and consent. Uh, forced removal from their lands, assimilation policies, uh, the inab their inability because of their minority situation to influence political decision making, and uh, as a result, often social uh, marginalization and, and disadvantages in access to education, uh, medical services, or natural resources. And all these problems uh, were somehow or were aimed to, uh, to be solved with uh, the establishment of international mechanisms of, of international rights. Uh, and one of them, a quite important one and early one, is the uh, ILO, International Labour Organization's um, conventions num Convention Number 169, which was maybe one of the first major international treaties um, uh, formulating indigenous rights. The Russian Federation uh, is a member of the ILO, but uh, didn't have uh, ratified the convention mainly because of the article 14 which uh, states uh, the right of ownership and possession of indigenous people over the lands that's something that uh, of course uh, due to the uh, russian legislation is a, a problem that cannot be solved because there is no uh, way to grant indigenous people ownership to land um, uh, nevertheless the uh, it's very important to mention that the russian constitution is explicitly mentioning indigenous rights in article 69 and here you see the formulation um, uh, consequently the on the federal level there were several rights uh, several laws were established one of the most important ones the federal law and the guarantees of rights of indigenous minorities of the russian federation in from 99 and then a, a law that affects the people i i speak here about very much and that's the law on territories of traditional nature use um, and uh, of, of numerically small indigenous people and so forth, uh, uh, issued in 2001. And then there were several changes to this law. And then there was also a, a federal uh, policy framework uh, for the sustainable development of the small indigenous uh, people of the North. Uh, and all that, mm, of course, uh, is stating and declaring rights of, of people to their lands. But uh, there's uh, in, in a lot of these documents, uh, especially the laws uh, declaring the rights of indigenous people, there's also activities mentioned uh, that might be in conflict with, uh, with these rights. And, uh, and uh, usually the formulations are, uh, are done in a way that uh, it allows for the use of uh, natural resources located on the territories of traditional natural uh, resource use by citizens and legal entities for implementation of commercial activities uh, um, if the mentioned activity does not disturb the legal regime of territories of traditional nature use. That's for, for instance from Article 13 of the law on traditional territories of uh, uh, territories of traditional nature use. So it means that there are always um, formulations in these laws that somehow allow 
um, allow uh, other use of these territories and of course we can imagine that the main uh, the, the, what, what is here behind these formulations are activities of industrial companies who want to extract uh, resources from under the ground like oil or gas uh, who allow for these kind of activities and, uh, and then refer to legal regulations that should be established elsewhere. So that is still a problem um, that um, that is somehow open. So there are rights to uh, to the lands and rights to the resources, but there are also uh, possibilities for other actors to um, to uh, extract uh, to 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 start economic activities on these lands. Um, but now back to the Kantimansi uh, Okrug, and this is actually a map that symbolizes. Uh, what I spoke about, this kind of uh, interference of oil production and what is called in the law traditional nature use. Uh, what you see here uh, is a map that is mapping on one side with the blue color, uh, the licensed oil fields. That's actually a map that is already a certain uh, uh, couple of years uh, old. So you don't see here, uh, you don't see all uh, of the oil fields, but you see also with the green color the territories of traditional nature use of the indigenous people uh, uh, and um, surprisingly all these uh, territories that the state granted to indigenous people almost all of them are overlapping or the majority of them are overlapping with the issues licenses to oil companies in the country uh, autonomous uh, district um, and uh, it means mm, that partly uh, when these territories of traditional nature use were granted to indigenous people, there were already licenses for oil production on these territories, but it happened also that um, uh, new oil fields are developed uh, on territories where uh, land titles, uh, as, we, as we could call these territories of national, traditional nature use, were already established. Uh, that's a huge number, uh, which also makes clear that uh, these territories of traditional nature use are granted in a lot of cases to single families or small groups of families. It's not that the whole whole tribe or the whole nation of Panti people or Nenets people or Mansi people get a huge um, territory like we know from the US where we have uh, reservations for Native Americans. Uh, here uh, in, in this Hanti Mansiski autonomous district, um, uh, the land titles were given out to uh, almost single families. This all started at 92 already at the very beginning of the post-Soviet period and it was mainly due to the um, to the activism of already mentioned uh, indigenous intelligentsia who said that we need uh, some kind of land titles, we need some kind of maps mapping the traditional territories of our reindeer herders uh, so they will have the possibilities to be recognized as living on these territories, as living on these areas. Uh, but back to the, to, the, to the thing that I started with, um, mapping the footprint, I will give you a little bit more visual impression on, on the uh, life of, of the indigenous um, reindeer herders and hunters and fishers. You remember this uh, picture I showed you a couple of minutes before that were the summer and winter pastures of one reindeer herding family uh, you can hear in the lower uh, left corner, maybe you don't see it on your device, this is one kilometer. So it's, it's almost 10 kilometers uh, uh, in dia di diameter. And here you see the same map uh, a little bit more southwards from the, from the satellite image before uh, from, uh, from an oil field. And you see the impact that the oil development has directly on the reindeer. Uh, pastures or would have if the if the family or had uh, at the time when the when still the reindeer herding family used to live on this on this land uh, so so uh, you can somehow compare the impact uh, uh, of establishing an oil field which is here established in a very particular manner it's called the branch uh, way of establishing uh, uh, drilling sites it means the oil field is growing like a tree from a main a uh, road, uh, little small roads are uh, diverging. And at the end of these roads, which here uh, um, you can see easily in white color on the satellite images, 
that's not snow that's actually sand it's uh, it's dams built by sand uh, so the machines can reach the drilling places uh, this is such a, a quite old picture of a typical drilling site uh, which which also contains an open pit for the drilling sludge that's the kind of mud that comes out of the of the drilling of the when 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 they drill for oil uh, and and it's a mixture of water and oil and sand uh, which should be stored here but of course should be carefully detained in that pit because it uh, the ecological damage is quite seriously when when this liquid is leaking out which unfortunately happens uh, now and then uh, that's a drilling place of the oil field which gives you a rough impression on the ecological also impact uh, of infrastructure established in the western siberian forest tundra uh, and uh, the same so be moved in as you can imagine here it's 50 meters now at the scale and I, for comparison i will just give you uh, a settlement uh, of a reindeer herding family i don't know how good your screen is but here you would see maybe you see at least here the little lighter spot that's actually three houses uh, uh, inhabited by two families and a, and a reindeer fence around and then you see barely you see here the the the, the road that they use uh, with their car to 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 drive to this over over the uh, through the forest to their settlement and the ejectant injectant uh, reindeer pasture uh, a big ecological problem still is the flaring of uh, of gas uh, which comes um, together with the oil uh, oil uh, drilling and oil production which is of course a major problem for uh, for air pollution it already became uh, smaller and was uh, limited in the last decades but uh, so in comparison with former times this problem at least got a little bit less serious as well as oil leaks which are of course not only a problem for people living in the regions but also a source of economic loss for the oil companies who who uh, are uh, interested in in not letting that happen but still uh, due to the fact that uh, the pipeline network is aging uh, uh, these kind of uh, breakages of, um, of pipelines happen and as i mentioned already another problem for leaking oil into the environment is are these open pits uh, called ambare in russian next to the very drilling places uh, of course uh, oil companies try mm, try to minimize their ecological impact also for their what we would call the, the, the social license to to drill so the the acceptance of oil production in society and ecological uh, activists are for, for are for sure uh, rallying for that uh, but also legislation who uh, forces uh, oil companies to pay attention to the environment uh, the problems that that remain are of course um, are of course se seriously uh, so especially it's the pasture land uh, that that shrinks and the possibilities for uh, fishing and uh, for also using the forest resources um, conflicts often arise also around sacred places uh, places of worship or old cemeteries, uh, which are of special religious and historical importance for, for the local people who used to live here for centuries. Uh, and also because these are symbolic features that are understandable for outsiders. Nobody uh, wants actually to, um, or everybody can imagine how, uh, how severe the destruction of these special cultural uh, places are for local people. Uh, there's a population pressure on indigenous lands by outsiders, mainly through poaching uh, and uh, also through stray dogs, uh, a problem that is not so often spoken about, but um, uh, that's really a problem for the reindeer herders because townspeople all, all, all often leave uh, their pets, uh, their dogs, um, either after their before or after their holidays, they just release them. They are these kind of people. Uh, still around and also some of the oil workers bring dogs uh, to their to their um, uh, living facilities on the oil fields and then these dogs escape and they start to attack the reindeer um, and uh, another um, kind of problem that uh, local Hanti face especially in the last uh, years is the the growing uh, control of uh, forest bureaucracy on 
uh, on their territories. All these lands belong to the uh, to the forest, um, uh, how to say, to the forest management of the Russian state. They they are under the managing uh, responsibility of the forest uh, administration. And actually, for every tree to cut uh, and for every uh, change to make in the forest, uh, the people who live in the forest have to ask for permission and have to ask for licenses. Something that was not very common still decades ago. Uh, but also mm, another still open problem is how to uh, improve the existing legis legislation in order to put pressure uh, on the companies to use technology like horizontal drilling uh, or other technological uh, resolutions or solutions to uh, limit and, and lower the impact on the uh, environment and on the indigenous lands. Um, yeah, one way of uh, out of the potential conflicts could be uh, a mechanism that we call social impact assessment that was developed as an instrument to be used uh, to avoid, uh, but also mitigate negative in impacts by industrial development. Uh, that is a, a, a kind of procedure that tries to assess um, uh, impact uh, on diverse aspects of human life, like health, material well-being, employment, uh, political participation, uh, but also social well-being and cohesion, um, population dynamics, cultural vitality, um, and the empowerment of local communities and, and their possibility for fate control or self-determination, uh, not to forget about education. Uh, 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 and all these uh, aspects are, uh, of course, as you easily can imagine, impacted by industrial development and might be uh, assessed by a, spe um, um, a special procedure uh, of impact assessment. Transnational companies that use, for instance, credits from international banks or are obliged to abide by the conditionalities of the loans. And this may include social, economic and cultural impact assessment uh, and compliance with the guiding principles and uh, operational directives, for instance, uh, of institutions like the World Bank. And, uh, and Russian companies do that if they are working with uh, international finances, uh, so they are uh, conducting this um, this impact assessment. Um, yeah, there is also an initiative uh, underway, and soon, um, hopefully, there will be a law on uh, what in Russian is uh, in Russian is called uh, ekologiska expertiza and uh, um, an eco uh, ethnographiska expertiza. Is we need, um, excuse me, um, uh, a kind of ethnographical expertise, which is something very similar to the social impact assessment. Uh, but uh, uh, but uh, unfortunately, it's kind of watered down to measuring the impact just on the economic activities of local people in order to provide a mechanism to provide for um, for economic compensation. And this is something that we have to understand is very different from uh, the way uh, that social impact assessment is working. While social impact assessment is uh, is aiming at an assessment of the impact in order also to allow not only for compensation for possible economic losses, but also for, first of all, avoidance of this impact or lim limiting these impacts, but then mitigation measures for the social uh, and cultural impact. And only at the very end, when this kind of impact is not able to, to be avoided, then there might be um, economic compensation for um, uh, for the destruct for the kind of uh, uh, destructive con consequences, I think um, I should come to an end um, shortly. I will uh, I will mention how the negotiation process look like looks like now in practice. Actually, a single um, uh, the state manages a register uh, of territories of traditional nature use and a register of heads of uh, families of these territories, and these heads of families are entitled to enter negotiations uh, with concrete oil companies working on their land. Here you see a picture of such a meeting of uh, representatives of a Hunty family uh, and the oil company and then some state officials uh, who uh, engage in these, uh, in these negotiations where usually the families would negotiate uh, the amount of compensation, but also would have a little 
uh, say in the planning of the oil company of uh, the establishment of infrastructure like drilling places on their land and might may have the possibility to say here we have our cemetery here we have our sacred site please move away um, with your drilling place uh, maybe some hundred meters to the side or with the at least with the construction of a road uh, but also mm, this kind of negotiations with oil companies lead to a change in lifestyle of the county population because oil companies offer for instance flats in the oil towns like here in Kogalim. this is a county family i used to live with which uh, which got a flat in Kogalim. Uh, and this, of course, uh, enables them to change their lifestyle, to incorporate urban, um, urban uh, elements to it. Uh, the oil companies often uh, offer education and also jobs for the children of these families, maybe even in um, hope that uh, the forest uh, will get empty uh, um, through these kind of measures that people would move out and leave, <coughs> leave um, uh, the way for the oil company to freely develop their uh, infrastructural projects and, and, and development projects. Actually, this does not happen um, the, at, the, at the opposite. Uh, it seems to us uh, anthropologists, at least, that indigenous uh, people, in this case, the Kanti families, use these new opportunities to broaden their economic possibilities and uh, to broaden their educational possibilities and uh, even to make their forest lifestyles and forest uh, life stronger so some um, some uh, children can for instance move to the city and look for jobs there and then support their families who still live in the forest because they understand that uh, to have a, a land title and to have a forest um, a settlement is something very important for their future yeah um, with this slide i i might end this is a kind of outlook the question uh, is there a culture of dialogue i would say yes and no uh, even with the limited uh, legal uh, frameworks ex uh, existing in, in Russia, uh, indigenous people have the possibility to engage directly, at, at least in the Kanti Mansi autonomous uh, uh, district, to, to engage directly with the oil companies um, to get direct compensation so they can perceive something that they can um, see as a just share, even if this would be uh, quite uh, far from, from an equal benefit sharing. Uh, or also, I would say, don't uh, fit to the to the uh, to the ideal of FPIC, uh, free, prior, and informed consent. Uh, but there are some kind of reciprocity relations based on patron-client relationship uh, between the Kanti family and the oil companies, where the the first exchange loyalty with the oil company for some economic benefits. And it resembles very much the kind of uh, relationship between, from the Soviet times, which was then called Chefstvo, a kind of patronage uh, of the big um, companies, industrial companies over Soviet kolkhozes or soft horses. Um, and, and still the relationship is much, uh, much the same with, with uh, on one side, a big sponsor uh, who is responsible for a wide range of issues from economic and cultural through health and education and infrastructure and on the other side, a kind of uh, client who has um, who, who can offer loyalty and can offer uh, dialogue and can offer a kind of um, uh, peaceful coexistence with the oil company. Yeah, maybe I will uh, I will end with this uh, again as at the beginning a picture of the central place in Kogalim and with this uh, very symbolic uh, monument depicting, it's called the drop of life. And you can imagine this drop is not a drop of water, it's a drop of oil. And here symbolically including uh, the indigenous habitants, inhabitants of the area in this, uh, uh, symbolizing their kind of includedness and inclusion that they, they have now, which is uh, a kind of very ambivalent, maybe sad as the reindeer herder looks like into the future. Yeah, thank you. I will stop here with my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. And I hope you have some questions. Okay, so <coughs> just if you switch off your presentation, yeah. we will see yeah. those who Hopefully I can see you as meeting. well. Okay, uh, uh, floor is open. And uh, Stefan, thanks a lot for a brilliant presentation with uh, uh, so excellent visual uh, materials and data. And uh, you have covered 
almost all dimensions, starting with economic, legal, ecological, and uh, we can just imagine uh, what would be your vision about scenarios if we see huge asymmetry in power between oil companies on the one hand and indigenous people on the other hand, right? And the lack of uh, law which would uh, basically stop uh, predator behavior by oil companies, maybe uh, within the next 20 years, you know, this image which you presented in your last slide, uh, you know, drop of oil uh, with uh, indigenous people in the center would disappear. Because, you know, you know, what's, the, you know, my question to you, while others think uh, about their questions, uh, you, you said that uh, there might be a law in Russia uh, that some kind of expertise uh, will be made, uh, but you know, two questions basically: Who will do this expertise? Who will decide? Uh, this is one thing, and whether or not the decisions made by those uh, so-called expert groups would be obligatory uh, for oilers. So, what can you say if you have any idea about you know tentative? Uh, or drafts yeah. About. yeah, of course, um, I would say I see some light in, in two directions. Uh, the one that you mentioned already is the improvement of uh, the legal framework uh, and the establishment of, um, uh, of mechanisms uh, of social impact assessment that actually work. Uh, also, um, uh, kind of uh, securing uh, hopefully the, the possibilities for self-determination and, and mechanisms for people to make their own decisions, uh, forms of, uh, um, of local self-governance. -govern but uh, of course, our, our hopes are, I mean, our experiences are not the best ones. And often uh, um, legislation that starts with very good intentions are, uh, um, are watered down and are kind of, um, diminished to rights are diminished to to, to just uh, declarations of rights without the mechanism to be really um, realized. That's one problem, but maybe there might be some hope. Let's see how that develops. What is the other side that is often for, forgotten are the ways um, that that are very known, very well known to indigenous people. Uh, and these are the, the, the use of informal relationship and of direct relationship with companies uh, and with the kind of real life people, uh, people, and that's very different, for instance, from um, company, uh, from relationship of companies to local people that we see in other parts of the Arctic, where the mechanisms are very formalized, uh, where the distance between the oil managers and, for instance, the reindeer herders is huge. They don't even speak the same language. They don't understand, they, they are not even able to understand each other. And what we see here, especially in our research, is that um, um, the approach of companies to the local population is, uh, is maybe due to the Soviet heritage also, is where the, the roads are very short. The, 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 the way to, to communicate is, is, is quite easy. So in no big, I saw that myself in this Western Siberian headquarter of Luke Oil. Uh, so the, the head of the Mark Scheider um, uh, a service of Luke Oil it has no problem to receive a, a reindeer herder in his office and, and to find a common language and to speak about the problems. And then they, even in the lack of legal, of a legal framework, they are able to avoid conflict. And this kind of conflict avoidance, which I see is, is, is there on the side of the oil companies, but it's also there a long tradition and long big culture of, of conflict avoidance is there on the side of indigenous people. And that's part of what we call resilience. Uh, the way to find a common language is actually even a bigger hope at the very moment for me and maybe for the indigenous people as well, then the improvement of legislation, which is important and has to be pushed forward. Yeah. But uh, let's see. I mean, the, 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 that's something uh, I don't even feel very uh, much um, competent about these legal issues. That's uh, 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 not, but I, of course, I have to, to deal with them as well. And maybe related questions, uh, question just uh, uh, on one of your slides, you have mentioned that there are uh, about uh, 1300 families living in uh, Ugra 
with about 4,000 family members. You know, can you give us idea about the major trends, uh, how many people ba basically live in oil rich regions in Russia? You know, what is at stake? Are we talking about people? Are we talking about 100,000 people? You know, just, you know, if we think about, you know, well being of uh, or peaceful coexistence, how many people are we are talking about? You, you said that we cannot uh, look at them at, as uh, those who speak in one voice, they are divided. They, they, we cannot consider them as a unified actor, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. But you know, how many families basically are suffering from this invasion by oil companies? Um, I wouldn't say, I, I wouldn't say, uh, suffering is not, the, uh, is not the right word. I would say they, ha they have to, to manage and either they can preserve uh, they can preserve their uh, way of lives and they can preserve their very unique relationship to the environment uh, and maybe this uh, relationship to the environment can teach us something uh, and and they are not only uh, uh, preserving themselves uh, they are also preserving uh, um, uh, other beings that are around there that are domestic animals first of all the reindeer herds and 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 maybe that's even more. I mean, it sounds uh, it sounds not uh, politically correct, but maybe the reindeer are more more important in this case than the people because uh, Russia is hosting the biggest reindeer domestic reindeer herds uh, of the world. Um, but of course, the number of people, the the population density in the Arctic is very low. So these people, all of these people, uh, are less than fifty thousand uh, people. All the all the forty mentioned uh, indigenous peoples in Russia. Uh, the biggest uh, are the Nanets, which live on the on the European side and on the other side of the Ural Mountains. And they are the, the biggest reindeer herders also. And Yamal is, uh, is, of course, the region which has the, the biggest reindeer herd of the world. Uh, several, I think, half a million uh, reindeer. Uh, and there are mm, like, uh, the, I can't give a number of the of the families that are uh, living, leading a nomadic way of life. Also something very unique for the Arctic because in the North American Arctic, all the nomadic uh, communities are long settled down and give up their nomadic way of life. This is something that survived the Soviet Union um, and is surviving the post-Soviet uh, uh, time. Uh, and so, so we might have to change our uh, our perception of, the, of, of Gazprom or the big oil companies as something Kind of destroying indigenous ways of life, um, uh, the, the 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 nomadic reindeer herders managed to uh, preserve this lifestyle sometimes uh, unbelievable ways uh, in the midst of these uh, of these dwelling places. Um, so the the numbers are very low, of course. Even in the Kanti Mansiski uh, Okruk, I showed this uh, pictures. They they became something like two percent of the of the whole population and in the in the nanets uh, areas north uh, yamal nanets areas it's, it's almost the same uh, they are very they're a little bit more uh, maybe five percent or ten percent of the of the population i don't have the numbers now but there are, there are questions in the in the chat as well uh, should i read them uh, yeah somebody is from the yeah tatiana is from the kanti mansiski autonomous Okrug. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. It's nice to meet people from the. Unfortunately, I can't see you, but uh, um, but it's nice to to, to meet people from yeah, the region. I, yeah. I like very much, and uh, I like the contrasts. You go through the oil fields, and you have all these industrial constructions, and a lot of dirt, and 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 and, and, and these cities that are kind of boiling uh, by businesses, and and a lot. You can see the money in Kanti Mansisk. You you. You can even feel the money that is there, and then you you drive somewhere to the forest, and and you arrive at a calm little space uh, with a little wooden hut and a, and a family living there with their animals. Um, I mean, uh, sometimes it's quite romantic, even if I try to avoid uh, idealizing and romanticism. Uh, what is the what are the main differences in approaches authorities and private companies interact with indigenous people in Russia and Scandinavia? That's a big question, of course. Um, I would say that the biggest uh, difference is that uh, the Scandinavian co um, countries established 
um, uh, the the uh, parliaments uh, kind of bodies, political bodies uh, for indigenous people called the Sami parliaments. And they, uh, in these three states, uh, Sweden, Norway, and uh, Finland, we have Sami parliaments with different uh, forms of political um, uh, competencies. While in Finland, I would say it's it's quite limited to cultural uh, issues, but they the, the Sami parliament in Finland tries also to gain um, competency over other aspects of uh, indigenous issues. <clears throat> in Norway, for instance, uh, there's much more, uh, how you would say, they, they have much more um, uh, areas of uh, self-definition, uh, uh, self-determination. Uh, the, in, in the hands of the Sami parliament, uh, Norway um, uh, adopted the ILO Convention 169, so uh, it has to grant uh, land ownership to the indigenous people and so on. This is the, the big, that, that's something that uh, uh, there's no body in Russia, uh, no polit political body that uh, could exercise these political rights. Uh, I would say there, there are, of course, a lot of other differences. But there is a, a special uh, committee at State Duma, uh, which yeah. is supposed to speak on behalf of indigenous people and peoples of the North. And by the way, European University, we are in good relationship with this uh, yeah. uh, committee. And uh, it's exactly this committee which developed the law you have mentioned. Yeah, yeah. And but there's, of course, the association of uh, the, the overall Russian association uh, of, of small numbered indigenous people of the far of um, the north, Siberia, and the Far East, called usually with the uh, abbreviation RIPON, uh, sitting in Moscow. Yeah. Um, and of course, uh, the Kanti Mans Mansiski Autonomous uh, Okrug went quite far in, uh, in, in legislative uh, matters and they established uh, a Duma uh, on, on, the, on the regional level. They have a uh, what in, in Russian is called palata. Uh, uh, no, it's called assembly, uh, uh, assemblea uh, of the state Duma of the Khanti Mansiski uh, Autonomous uh, Okrug uh, with uh, four, uh, four um, uh, members that uh, deal with these issues. Yeah. You, you had another question, Tatiana? Or... No, thank you. It was really interesting for me. I didn't hear that, and uh, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, there was there was a question on on the on on the notion of guilt, uh, uh, in in the role of guilt in compensation issues. Um, mm, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say this is the case for Russia. Um, um, I mean, the, the, this would open the whole question of uh, the notion of colonization uh, in Russia, which, uh, which is a big discussion among scholars, uh, because the, first of all, the history uh, of, of Russia is very peculiar, and the forms of domination uh, of the political center over the periphery uh, is also much more complicated, I would say, than to be boiled down to the uh, to the relationship of settlers and indigenous people, uh, a lot of uh, Russian inhabitants of the periphery uh, cannot be seen as, as settler communities moving on to into um, into indigenous lands because there are also indigenous groups who moved into the lands of other indigenous groups or the Nanets in the European part of Russia who we know moved. Uh, uh, slightly before the Russians, they arrived at the lands that uh, that is now inhabited by Russians and Nanats alike. So it's even difficult to say who were the fur, who, who were the first there. The, the, the Nanats have a notion of uh, of uh, a certain people who lived before there, the so-called Sihirtya, and the Russians have the notion of certain people living before there, the so-called Chuts. Um, and both Sirtia and Schutz, which may be the same people, they disappeared somehow or dissolved among the Russians or Nanats, who knows. But so who are the indigenous in, in, the, in these areas around Archangelsk, for instance, the Nanats or the Russians? Uh, so this makes the whole relationship between indigenous people and the, and the majority population uh, um, different from the, from, the, from the US case. And uh, also the question of guilt. I, I heard I, maybe something similar I heard in the Kanti Mansiski um, Okruk uh, former um, governor Filipenko 
um, he actually organized um, a huge transfer of reindeer to the reindeer herders uh, from the north. They bought a huge herd of reindeer from the neighboring area and, and granted it to the reindeer herders in the Kanti Mansi area uh, uh, as a kind of compensation for the damage that was done through uh, collectivization at the Soviet times, because a lot of families uh, suffered from uh, um, from uh, from confiscation of of their reindeer herds. Uh, they they suffered because they were um, they were just uh, the the reindeer was just confiscated and put into the state uh, into into the uh, collective enterprises or then later state enterprises, and people never received that back. So the governor um, decided uh, this kind of um, symbolic step. And maybe that can be seen as a kind of uh, compensation for injustice that was done uh, during the Soviet time. Uh, I at least uh, I would say some parts of the of the public would uh, and the reindeer herders themselves perceived it as a kind of um, compensation for injustice. But uh, uh, of course, we know that a lot of families also have memories of being trust uh, being um, treated uh, uh, not very. Uh, just full during the during the first decades of uh, oil uh, development. So sometimes the oil companies didn't pay attention to cemeteries. They just uh, destroyed the um, settlements that they were they would perceive to be empty because people would just uh, seasonal settlement. They would just le um, have left to the to another settlement for 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 the winter, and then the the bulldozers would put away the summer camp and. Uh, and people would not have the possibility to, during Soviet times to even complain about that. But um, I wouldn't say that this plays a big role now. Maybe in these informal talks that I mentioned when the families come to the oil companies and they can say, but you know, you don't uh, forget what you have done to us. Uh, so, um, but it's more this kind of question than how the dialogue goes on and, and how this is played out uh, in this, um, not in the public sphere, in, in, in the kind of behind closed doors, I would say. Maybe there's something. Uh, and, and of course, I feel also a kind of empathy and um, understanding from the side of the oil, uh, of the oil uh, managers and of oil workers who often say that, yeah, we understand very much. We feel pity and, and empathy with um, people who have to suffer. And uh, and then maybe that is also motivating them for uh, doing something different or uh, for for helping uh, them with, uh, for instance, transportation with uh, some uh, kind of material uh, help that they can just uh, organize. That that plays a role, but more on the informal level. Yeah, if that answers your question. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Did that answer my question? Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, Stefan, uh, I might ask you another question, which refers to your profession. Uh, if I understood you correctly, if uh, the law, which is uh, now considered uh, in Russia by State Duma, uh, will lead to growing demands uh, for specialists in the field, namely anthropologists like you. So, uh, and uh, you will be a person or people of your profession will be those who will decide who is right and who is wrong and how to find a common denominator between interests of oil companies and indigenous people. Maybe I'm a little bit exaggerating, but you know, my question is about you know, the major ways of your profession as a scholar. What are your methods? How anthropologists in general work with indigenous people? Yeah, that, that's actually, that's, um... An important question, and it's problematic because um, anthropologists start usually with the uh, with the principle: the the informant is always right. So whatever people tell you, you take it seriously. You don't question it. You try to understand what people want to say you. Uh, and uh, when it comes to uh, con conflictuous notions on resource use, for instance, where people have different points of views, so you have no possibility to, to decide who is right. You can just try to understand why people make certain claims and why people are saying this and that. So we are usually not the ones who take uh, on the, the duty to, um, to decide where the truth is. We try to 
<clears throat> to try to understand the, the diversity of truth and the, the, the different truths that might be there, and the truths of the oil company and the truths of the, of the local people. Um, and uh, if, if anthropologists can be something in these kind of conflicts, they can be translators. They, can, uh, they might be able to, to translate what people say in a language that is understandable not only for the oil company, but also in legal terms in, in these kind of social impact assessments. So if people uh, tell us stories, tell us their biographies and tell us the way they, they interact with the, with the environment, with their animals, maybe even with their spirits and their, their gods uh, on the sacred places, we try to, to, um, to translate that into a language that is understandable for, for the law. That's, that might be a competence uh, we might develop and that we also will use for, for um, writing uh, impact assessments. What is very difficult for anthropologists is to do forecasting. Uh, that's something that uh, maybe our colleagues sociologists are much better into. Uh, usually we don't uh, deal with, um, with big samples, we don't deal with, uh, with quantitative uh, um, kind of methods. We just use uh, we use uh, qualitative um, methods and then we come to qualitative, uh, of course, uh, uh, kind of conclusions, which uh, can, can hardly make any kind of forecast. Of course, we can, we can uh, use our knowledge of the past, we can use our knowledge of the, the mechanisms of social change in order to uh, assess the impact that certain uh, future change can have to local communities and can have to concrete uh, small scale small scale communities. But that's also the reason why usually not anthropologists would be hired for doing this kind of compensation, uh, the, 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 the mechanism that is, uh, is, um, is functioning now is this kind of assessment of, 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 of lo economic loss. And uh, anthropologists are not the one who will count for the economic loss. They will say, okay, this might be um, damaging for, uh, for reindeer herding, but there might be some effects that you even don't see when you when you do an assessment of economic loss because you don't see the the little details you don't see that on one side the pasture is diminishing but on the other side um, there's a road uh, which will make it easier for the family to to actually trade the reindeer um, uh, um, uh, the, the 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 meat uh, so maybe the family needs even less meat in order to reach the uh, in order to make uh, like reach the economic level that they aim at. So these kind of complex uh, interrelationships that, for instance, um, economists um, might not see, mm, that's something where an anthropologist um, uh, could be of use. And I think the future in these kind of um, uh, impact assessment and also in the, in the, in the me legal mechanism will be in uh, multidisciplinary research where anthropologists should uh, join forces with ecologists, with biologists, with uh, economists, uh, in order to uh, use different methods uh, for 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 doing, for instance, a forecast. I mean, some of my colleagues from Moscow they established a, a consultancy that is working already for several years. These kind of impact assessments are done um, successfully, more or less, in Yakutia. Uh, also, uh, the companies that I mentioned that work with uh, international money, um, they hire anthropologists who uh, write them conclusions uh, on, um, on projects. I know that Gazprom was hiring some of my colleagues for doing uh, these kind of assessment uh, at Yamal uh, for a pipeline through the up, uh, uh, through the mouth of the river up, and so on, on Sakhalin. Uh, anthropologists were hired and of course we are writing uh, quite uh, yeah long texts i would say uh, quite fine descriptions of, of the local social fabrics and how they might be affected by changes um, economic change and, and, and environmental change but uh, taking into account a lot of aspects like i mentioned like the the spiritual uh, domain uh, that economists would wouldn't even see uh, the kind of effects of, of of these cultural aspects that's something that anthropologists are, are very well trained um, also because this is expressed in a language in a symbolic language 
um, that uh, neighboring disciplines are not uh, able to interpret or don't have the maybe the the right uh, methodological instruments to um, to translate in for instance the language of law yeah just you know maybe two ads uh, one uh, uh, more point uh, maybe I, I would like to show you the book uh, i think that stefan knows this book uh, pretty well the depths of yeah, russia yeah, yeah. oil power and culture by douglas rogers yeah wrote about uh, in the impact of oil on uh, uh, communities in perm region in russia you know, excellent anthropological research of what might happen with uh, uh, oil boom uh, in a particular region. But of course, in case of Russian Arctic or Russian North, it, the situation is much more complicated, much more complicated, much more interesting. Okay, uh, any, anybody else would like to ask uh, Stefan? Don't be afraid of asking. Um... Anything you want, wanted ever to know about uh, anthropology or about the North or about the people inhabiting the North? Um... Okay, if not, uh, uh, Stefan is with European University, you know, as I said, one of his affiliations, fortunately for us, is with uh, our Center for Studies of the North. And, uh, uh you know we work together and I, I do hope that we'll work together in the future and uh, maybe our students at, uh, at least uh, energy politics in eurasia will be fortunate to take his course next semester or maybe next academic year uh stefan thank you so much for being with us you know it was fascinating presentation and i very much enjoyed uh listening to you and uh listening to discussion and, uh, you know, I wish everybody, uh, you know, happy <laughs> New Year since uh, I won't be able to meet with my students and happy Christmas, of course, and uh, let us yeah. be safe and healthy. So this is the most important for all of us. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay. Hope bye to bye. see you again at some point. And uh, yeah, hopefully the, also the ones who will watch the lecture then afterwards on the internet. Um, Thank you very okay. much. Thank and you. Have a nice Christmas. Bye bye.